Now, uh, before joining the University of Tasmania, James was a senior lecturer at the University of Portsmouth from 2009 to 2014. Uh, prior to that, he was an ARC funded postdoctoral fellow working with Professor Neil Brewer at the Flinders University here in Adelaide. Uh, and he's also interested in the effects of video games and design features within games on players' cognition and behavior. Recent work has focused on the effects of gambling like reward systems, e.g., loot boxes in video games. So welcome, Jim. Thank you so much for zooming in today. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah. So I came across your submission uh, in 2018 with the government Senate inquiry into loot boxes. Can you um, explain to me what is a loot box or a chance based uh, chance based item? Yeah, for sure. So um, I guess the first thing to note is that loot boxes are they're not homogenous, you know, they, they take different forms, they offer different types of rewards, and they can be bestowed on players for different reasons. Um, when we use the term loot box, typically what we're talking about is a, a digital container that offers players a virtual in-game reward. But loot boxes, as I say, they can, be, they can be given to players for different reasons. You might get loot boxes as rewards for completing in-game tasks. Yeah. But the ones that we're really interested in are the ones that players have to pay to access. Uh -huh. And so this is a situation where you, 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 know, you are given the opportunity to pay money to open a digital crate. And in that crate will be, will be some reward. It might be a reward that alters the in-game cosmetics. You know, it might be a skin for your character. Mm. It might be a reward that confers a more significant competitive advantage, you know, a weapons upgrade. Right. Or, um, and the key thing, of course, here is that what we've got is a, an exchange mm. of, of money for an unknown reward that's delivered, mm. you know, where, where the, um, the value of that reward varies according uh -huh. to... Uh -huh. yeah. So I notice you've got uh, Mario World 2 on your background. Now, there are coins in Mario, uh, mm. and, and sometimes you get these secret bricks that pop out, random coins. Is that a loot box? No, no, that, that's, a different, that's a different kind of setup. That's still a... Um, that's a, 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 a function of the game. You yep. know, that's a, that's a task you complete. And obviously, some of the, some, sometimes, you know, you find these little random sort of hidden items in games, but that's a different thing to a, a reward mechanism. Right. You know? So in, um, say, Fortnite, for example, they've got loot llamas. Would that be considered a loot box? I'm going to, you know, at the risk of, of seeming like a complete noob, I'm gonna. I'm going to have to um, acknowledge my ignorance. I've never played Fortnite. I know uh -huh. it's a phenomenon, but yeah. I've never played it, so I can't speak to to that particular. Yeah. yeah. So um, in in Fortnite, you, from my understanding, you can get rewarded loot llamas or buy them, and when you smash them, um, prizes and skins and little special things pop out of that randomly. Description? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that, yeah. That, that, and. Categorizes them. Good and love it. So exciting. Uh, what happens is um, there's a really nice video by Celia Hodent, the UX designer of Fortnite, where she explains how Loot Llama in Fortnite is so much better. It's like you, you're about to swing to hit it, and the llama actually responds. It opens its eyes. It like it starts like um, cringing at you uh, because it's responding to you. So it's even more interactive in that mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. And, and this is this is one of the things is that um, these and 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 one of the things we should we should say up front. Yeah. There is nothing inherently problematic about reward mechanisms in video games. You right. know, that are designed to reward player investment in the game or to yeah. to maintain player engagement with the game. So right. The, the, the bells and the whistles and the flashing lights and the animations that go along with these rewards that capture attention and keep players mm. engaged. There's nothing inherently problematic about that mm -hmm. where where our interest came in, in in the issue of loot boxes is that there are some there are some psychological similarities between some loot box mechanisms and more conventional forms of gambling right and, right uh, you know, a reward mechanism in and of itself is, is is fine but once you start to stray into the the territory where people are ex essentially exchanging you know money or some other valuable good 
in exchange for a random outcome that's determined by, you know, at least partly by chance, mm -hmm. starting to get that psychological overlap between that activity yeah. and more yeah. conventional forms of gambling. Yeah. And that's when we start to think maybe we should be interested. Yeah, because I get parents who have their kids, like, for example, I saw yesterday a parent uh, had an 11 year old boy and the boy is not allowed to play Fortnite. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think that w the main reason is because of the, the loot boxes, but it's the, um, uh, the violent aspects of the game. But a lot of parents don't, don't realize, and some of the kids that I see, the kids steal money. They steal money from credit cards, like thousands of dollars to spend on virtual currency called V-Bucks to spend in games like Fortnite. And... Uh, yeah, it's, it's, you know, they get into debt and next thing you know, the parents are like, what, what's this charge on the credit card and the kid's stolen money? Um, so that, that, you know, is a real concern for parents. Uh, I guess um, the government into, well, the, the Greens, I think, the Greens um, submitted that inquiry into loot boxes and um, microtransactions. Can you talk a little bit more about microtransactions and... Um, yeah, what was the finding of regards to uh, loot boxes, um, the Australian government, and gambling? Absolutely. So, um, let, okay, so we'll, we'll start off with, um, with with microtransactions. So, loot boxes, or at least loot boxes that people pay to access, are a, are a form of microtransaction. So, a microtransaction is any sort of, yeah, sometimes called in-app purchases, you know, yeah. any situation where you, you, you've obtained the game, but now you have to pay a little bit more to unlock this thing or a little bit more to, 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 to access this, this loot box, you know? Um, and so, yeah, obviously microtransactions are a monetization um, mechanism. And yeah. going back in 2016, you know, the top grossing apps on the app store were all free to play. Mm. They, they made their revenue exactly the yeah. and it's, it's, it's again that kind of idea that look, you get someone you get some, someone into it you get them invested and then you make them pay a little bit more you know to, to access the next thing or you know candy yeah. crush classic you know you can you can either wait a period of time to keep playing or you can pay a little bit to buy extra lives yeah so yeah obviously some researchers have been interested in whether or not or, or to what extent um, microtransactions might be predatory monetization methods. Yep. And yeah, there's clearly a potential for, for problems there. Um, it's, it's not necessarily something I've paid. I've devoted a lot of time to, but I know people like Dan King mm. Abra, have, have written a lot on that. So, so that's the microtransaction issue. Um, yeah, the, the loot box and gambling issue. So yeah, we had the, the parliamentary inquiry in Australia, um, Senator Jordan Steele, John sort of promoted that. And, um, yeah, we, my, my colleague Aaron Drummond and I, um, we were lucky enough to go along. We, we provided a written submission we mm. and, and, and testify there, provide some expert evidence. Um, and the upshot seemed to be that the report of the committee to which we testified suggested, look, yes, there's, there's reason to be paying attention to this issue. Mm. You know, we, there's, there's overlap here between some loot box systems and more conventional forms of gambling. Yeah. Um, it's worth further investigation. When this went up, I think to the Senate, the the, the it all boiled down to, to a fairly non-committal. We need more research is required, you know, <laughs> and, and and it kind of got. I think it just got left there. Yeah. In contrast, um, in other countries around the world, mm. we've seen a, we've seen a a variety of regulatory responses. Yeah. You know, um, some countries require game developers to disclose the odds. Um, uh huh. Of, of obtaining valuable rewards before yep. uh, over in, in Europe. So the UK had its own parliamentary inquiry and they, they were much, uh, much clearer in the recommendation coming out of that inquiry that yes, mm. it would be regulated as a form of, of gambling. Yeah. And in Europe, the, the, uh, the move has been more towards the increasing consumer awareness, increased consumer information, content ratings, you know, content information on packaging, which I think is, and, and in some countries, obviously, you've also seen things go right down the other end to the banning of loot boxes. Yeah. Uh, my, my feeling is that at this point, we know, so we, we know there's psychological similarities between loot boxes and conventional forms of gambling. 
And we also know there's a, a pretty robust finding emerging in the literature, thanks to some work that a guy named David Zendel in the UK has done, and some work that, that Aaron and I have done, that shows that people who have, um, people, who, people at high risk of problematic gambling, so mm. people who are high on the problem gambling severity index, yep. tend to spend disproportionately more. Right. The, the link between problem gambling symptomology and lupus. Wow. Now, we don't, we clearly don't know if that's a causal relationship or what direction it runs in. But it does suggest that people who are at risk of, of you know, or people who have risk factors associated with increased risky behavior, gambling behavior, tend to spend more on these things. But as I say, the, the key thing here is we don't know yet. It's too soon. We don't have enough data to tell what even the short to moderate term consequences, let alone the mm. long consequences yep. of these mechanisms are. So for that reason, when it comes to kind of regulatory responses, um, my colleague and I, Aaron and I, we definitely favor the more consumer choice, informed decision-making kind of regulation rather than the outright banning, which is probably- Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I just looked up um, the odds of winning Ronaldo or Messi in FIFA okay. in uh, that video game, uh, FIFA 20. Um, you know, people want to build their dream squad, their dream, team combining players from different nations and leagues to make their ultimate team and they can be improved by opening packs from the store or else buying players on the transfer market mm. packs can be bought using real money on ea points or else in-game currency called fifa coins and the packs contain random assortment of players and other items but due to protests over gambling and loot boxes ea sports now show the odds of what you can open in each pack. Um, and the, the, the chances of opening Lionel Messi and Christi Cristiano Ronaldo are very slim. You get different packs, bronze, silver, and gold packs from the store. And it looks like the rarest ones are like the ones you open in gold packs. Uh, and the odds start from a gold pack costing 7,500 coins or 150 points had odds of 3.3% of getting a player rated 83 or higher, 3.3%. So every time you open a, a, a hundred packs, three of those could be uh, a, I don't know how much a pack costs, but I'm assuming it costs around about, I mean, a microtransaction has to be like $10 and lower, right? Like, is that the definition? Is there a definition or? I, 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 that, I, I, I'm pretty sure I've come across that. Yeah, it probably varies a little bit, but yeah. Um, yeah. And, and of course, it's interesting when you look at the conversion, you know, you, 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 the virtual currency or the points that you can use in games to purchase rewards, right? You can generally earn those. You can sort of, what's the word? You can grind those. Yeah. Out of, yeah. Um, that, or of course you can, you can buy them. Yeah. And that idea of converting real currency into virtual currency that you then spend on these rewards is psychologically interesting in and of itself. I think mm. probably not, hasn't received yep. a lot of research attention yet. Yeah, and, and so um, in your submission brief, you talked about Mark Griffiths, uh, you know, very famous um, and prolific publisher on this, this topic. He has uh, five psychological criteria. Did you want to talk around what the psychological criteria that's considered gambling? Yeah, I think that's probably, probably a, a good thing to do. So this is uh, in, in our paper. This is how we determined the psychological similarity between loot box mechanisms and, and gambling was we, we looked at which loot box mechanisms met Griffith's criteria. Yeah. There essentially five criteria, as you say. Um, the first is, to, so, so these criteria are intended to distinguish gambling behaviors from other risky behaviors. Yeah. The idea here is that you have to exchange money or some other valuable good you don't know what you're getting when you make mm -hmm. that exchange. Yeah. What you get is determined by chance, or at least partly by chance. Yeah. So th those are the kind of the three key ones in my mind. Mm. Um, you're paying for something you don't know what it is. It might be good. It might not. Um, then there's the the criteria that you have to you have to be able to opt out. You know, you you, you can avoid losses by not engaging with the yep. transaction. Yeah. Um, because of course if if you don't have the opportunity to, to opt out, it's not really gambling. It's more just extortion, right? <laughs> right, right. And so, and the fifth one is winners have to gain at the expense of losers. 
Right. You know? And this is an interesting one mm. when it comes to loot boxes, you know, because if you're playing poker with somebody, yeah, yeah, someone wins the money, wins the pot, and other people lose. In loot boxes, there are a couple of ways we could think about um, losing in that transaction. Mm. In this case, the house is essentially the game developers who you're paying yeah. for. Yeah. Yeah. There are a couple of ways you can lose. The, the first is a player can lose if, 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 if some people who open loot boxes are getting competitive advantages over they others. Get, if they get the Ronaldos and they've got a full team of Ronaldos. Right, that's it. If, you know, if, someone, if, if someone's out there getting Ronaldos and Messi's and someone else is getting Jim Saw, you know what I mean? Right. Jim Saw is losing yep. out. Yep. Um, the other way we can think about losing is that obviously there's a, there's a price point, there's a cost to buy a loot box or to open a loot box. And at least for some loot boxes, there are online marketplaces where the rewards you get from the loot box can be bought, sold and traded. Yeah, yeah. In marketplaces, these virtual items have a real world currency value. Yeah, yeah. In some cases, as low as like three cents. Now, yeah. spend $2.50 US to open a loot box mm. and you get a reward that's worth three cents. Yeah. There's an argument to be made that you've incurred a financial loss. Yeah, you know? Yeah, uh, for our paper, when we looked at the, the the loot boxes we looked at, we took a, we took the conservative criterion and we said, look, we won't worry about the online marketplace. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll only say that the, that fifth criterion, the winners profiting at the expense of losers, is met in conditions where the items you win confer that significant. Yeah, payment. yeah, yeah. So, for example, um, I only just found out last week talking to a young uh, patient of mine. Um, they were talking about Roblox. Now, Roblox is a very popular children's game, um, you know, not as popular as Minecraft, but, you know, getting there. Um, in countries like Dubai, it's banned. Um, and I never really understood why, but this child was telling me that, um, you know, it's essentially um, you can modify the games and make your own games. But there was a third party website where people were trading and selling their virtual items and uh, the way you get these items is through a loot box mechanism and uh, I had to explain to them in front of their parent that this can, with the psychological um, definition of gambling this is a form of gambling and companies like Roblox the publishers try to shut these third-party websites down because they know that by having this mechanism that they're essentially turning their game into a mini casino. And so this is, this is the important point to raise. A lot of, um, so uh, you know, Valve and, and Counter-Strike Global Offensive, CSGO. Yeah. You know, one of the, first, the first games for which skin, skins became massive and there was skin trading and third party websites popped up and eventually, you know, Steam uh, or Valve made its own marketplace to kind of regulate yeah. that, that trading. Um, but it's worth noting that an, but yes, you have, you have official marketplaces, you have a lot of third-party marketplaces. And a, mm. a lot of the game developers, the publishers that don't operate their own marketplaces often include in the user agreements explicit pro, you know, prohibitions about buying, selling, or trading. Right. Rewards. So they're, because as you say, they're aware that once that becomes a, a thing, the behavior in the game can, can, you know, under some, and again, gambling is a, Gambling is a thing with a legal definition, you know, and so when mm. we talk about regulation, there are legal definitions there and those are matter for legal scholars. Yeah. Psychologists who are interested in how engaging with these mechanisms affect players. Mm. Because once you can buy, sell, trade, once these things obtain a value, um, they will meet the psychological, in some cases at least, they'll, they'll meet many, if not all of the psychological criteria. Yeah. Yeah. And companies don't want that because they're, yeah then involves, you know, a, a yep. legal battle or at least mm. line, all sorts of things that they'd rather avoid. Yeah, well, the, it sounds like from the 2018 Senate inquiry, the Australian government decided not to ban loot boxes because, because it didn't meet the Australian legal definition of gambling. What, 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 what do you think, where does that leave uh, researchers like yourself? Where does it leave parents? Where do we go from here? Do we uh, sit around and wait until the next one comes around or do we just sort of accept that loot boxes are here to stay here in Australia? Uh, so I, it's, a, it's a really good question and I have to admit, I'm, I'm not sure. 
I'm not sure what, what's coming up. Technology moves so quickly that maybe loot boxes won't even be the thing in a couple of years' time. You know, right. we'll be talking about some whole other kind of mechanism. But so one of the issues um, that, that we've had in the past, uh, and I, I think this contributed to the Australian government's position as well, is the idea that no matter what you say about psychological criteria, it's not gambling because the things you're winning are worthless. You know, it's just, it's just stuff that exists in video games in the mm. virtual world. It doesn't, me doesn't mean anything, which, mm. which doesn't mesh with the inherent view of gamers. You know, as a game, I'm a gamer. I've been a gamer for 30 years. You yep. know? I know how invested you can get in a game and I know oh. how hard you work to try to achieve games and, and, and win trophies in games and all yep. sorts of um, People who don't play video games, I think, don't necessarily have the appreciation of the psychological investment and attachment. Mm. You know, that, that yep. people... But they've argued, yes. So, so an argument that's been put forward against the idea of regulating access to loot boxes is that the, the, the rewards are worthless and therefore can't be considered gambling. Uh -huh. And I have recently published another paper that actually right. uses economic theory. Yeah. So look, no, these... Almost, almost economic theories differ in terms of what value is, but almost all of them argue that the best way to index value is to look, are people prepared to pay money for a thing? Yeah. And if they are, the amount they're prepared to pay is the, the best way to index the value of that thing. Right. So we, we published a paper that, that showed what was, we thought, pretty obvious, um, and certainly mm. obvious gamers. These things have value. People will pay money for these things, and they'll pay that money over and above Right. But they played just to play the game. So it's not like right. they just, it's not like they have like a, a gaming budget and they yep. spend some on games and some on loot boxes. The money they would have spent on games, the stuff they spend on loot boxes is in addition to that. So it's independently valuable. Right, right, right. So that we, we think um, kind of undercuts the argument that these things can't be regulated as a form of gambling because. Mm. You know, because they don't have value, because we argue that they do. We show they do empirically yeah. have. So the question then becomes, what's the appropriate form of regulation? Right. As I said before, we 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 don't we don't we we wouldn't think at this point that there's justification to talk about banning these items, but there probably is. We we probably need increased consumer information, as you were saying when you're talking to to your clients and their parents. Yeah. Explaining how these mechanisms work yeah, and, and helping gamers and their parents be aware of the, you know, the potential for risk, you know, yeah. to understand what these, what these mechanisms do, because these are, you know, as psychologists, we know variable ratio reinforcement, the idea that you, you, you intermittently reinforce a behavior, you know, and if it's, if it's reinforced on a seemingly random schedule, yeah. It, it, you get rapid acquisition, frequent yep. repetition, and the behavior persists even when rewards become less frequent, right? Yep. This, this just works. It works for rats. It works for pigeons. It works for people playing poker machines. Australian kids. <laughs> Australian kids, right? And so if we, can, if we can increase consumer understanding of that, I think that's where we need to direct our... Yep. our and, and whether or not the government wants to form, formally regulate, that's a, as I said, that's a, that's a policy yep. a decision. But as as people interested in gaming and people interested in the well-being of gamers. Yeah. You can offer that information and help people understand what's, you know, the, the mechanisms they're being exposed to. Yeah. That's yeah. Very common question that I get from parents is if, 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 if these games, Fortnite, Roblox, um, Call of Duty, um, are, you know, um, CSGO are having mechanisms, variable ratio schedules, loot boxes, chance based items. Does that mean my child's going to be, Become a gambling addict or a problem gambler in the future. Um, you know, it's really interesting to read that little section in your paper as well. Um, the re relationship between uh, gaming with loot boxes and gambling later on in life in, say, a casino or a poker machine. So the um, the, the concern that loot boxes or you know these kind of chance based rewards, the concern that they might be a a gateway to future gambling behavior that's that's a common concern it's an idea that that's out there yeah um i i have to be honest and say i i don't think at present we have any data to support that claim yeah, yeah. um 
it, which is which is not to, which is not to say there's 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 no merit in it. We, we simply don't have the data to know one way or another. Yeah, but there are probably there there are probably some some things we can say. Right. Although we know that human beings can learn through observing others, you know, mm-hmm. classic bobo dolls, where you know if somebody sees somebody being rewarded for punching a bobo doll, they're more likely to go and punch the bobo doll themselves. Right. We, know that modeling takes place right we also know that from a young age people learn that the appropriateness of a behavior is context dependent mm. and so a behavior that's appropriate in a in a movie or a behavior that's appropriate in a video game doesn't necessarily translate to being appropriate outside that context mm-hmm. you know and, and and even kids can you know we we often there's, there's a tendency to to think about this thing in a kind of a monkey see monkey do, you know, that right. they'll just mindlessly repeat behaviors they've observed, but even, yeah. even learn that context matters. Yep. Um, and they're relatively young age. And, and so as, as a kind of analogous issue, obviously one of the, one of the hottest topics in, in gaming research is the relationship between violent video game content <laughs> and post game violence, yep. you know, and a lot's been, a lot's been said by a lot of people in a lot of places about that relationship. Yep. But all the best data we're seeing now is all converging on the idea that if there's a relationship between exposure to violent video game content and and post game out of game aggression, yep. if the relationship exists, it's very very small. Mm-hmm. And most of the best studies we're seeing now are, are finding relationships that are essentially null. You know right. that the evidence is essentially zero. Yeah, and so that kind of that that's an indication that content children encounter in video games doesn't necessarily translate to behaviour outside video games. Yeah, yeah. That might that might apply to things like gambling, like reward mechanisms. Too. Yeah, but as I said, we we simply don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think um, you know the concerns around violence and gambling and even drug use down the track and the relationship with gaming, I think is that, that the forefront um, concern. But as a child psychiatrist, for me, the, the problems that parents come in that are immediate are kids not going to school, worsening of anxiety, loss of time, um, and spending, you know, losing sleep playing video games. Um, you know, you're, you're on school holidays with your own child uh, right now. Um, there's, does all this information for you as a uh, lecturer and psychologist and researcher, does that change the way you approach your parenting or? Um, Absolutely. You know, like you, you try to, yeah, I, 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 I'm a big fan of the saying, science is not a sometimes food. You know what I mean? Like if, 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 you, if, if you're a person who's committed to kind of science and research and evidence-based decision-making, you, you, you want to try to do that in all areas of your life as much as possible, right? And so, yeah, what I know about, the relationship between media consumption and and other behaviors you know I, I certainly try to bear in mind when i'm parenting my child um and uh yeah my, my child plays video games we play video games together yeah the, the 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 critical and, and, and look there are some games that i'm like he's he's just like with some movies tv shows they're not intended for child audiences right yeah you know, we're not we're not sitting there playing Grand Theft Auto together, but we are playing Lego games. You know what I mean, yep. or Marvel, whatever the case may be. Mm. Um, but it's like anything else, any behaviour. If you if you engage in it excessively, yeah, has the potential to cause maladaptive outcomes. You yep. know, um, and 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 you've only got so many hours in the day, and time you spend on the more time you spend on one behaviour, the less time you have to spend on other things. You know, yeah, that's true not just for video games, because that idea of the displacement hypothesis, you know, too much time for video games, not enough time studying, bad for academic performance, which is not, it turns out, necessarily the case. Um, But that's true for baseball or baking or gardening. You you know what I mean? Like anything anything you're spending an excessive amount of time on is detracting time from other potentially valuable activities. Yeah. My advice is always, it's not, this is not rocket science, but it's, you know, moderation. You know, one of the one of the things I guess to be you know aware of is that for a lot of people, myself included, video games are an immersive and intensely enjoyable pastime. You know, 
love playing video games. Given, you know, <laughs> I, I would happily sit and play video games all day, but I know that's not a, a you know, that's not a healthy choice. Yeah. So, you know, you have to, you have to go, no, we'll play some games now and then we'll go for a walk or we'll do something yep. else, reading. And it's the same, it's the same with your kids. You know, it's, it's about setting boundaries mm. and engaging in things to a, to a sensible extent rather yep. than, an extent. and I, yep. that, I'm not an expert in, in, in at least in parenting, but yeah, yeah. Imagination. but that to me seems like the, the way to handle this kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And any, any games that you're playing at the moment that, uh, that you really enjoy? So I, I love, um, I love sports simulations. So I'm, uh -huh. I'm playing NBA 2K at the moment and really enjoying uh -huh. that. Um, and uh, I also have a, I also tend to like some of the games that, you know, are supposedly bad for you, you know, like the Grand Theft Autos, but with yeah. my, like I said, we play a lot of the, um, the PlayStation 4 Lego games. So uh -huh. Lego Ninjago is a, a great game. Lego Star Wars, that kind of stuff. Yeah, great. Yeah, I, um, I saw a patient yesterday, actually, who uh, uh, plays basketball and is really, you know, a talented basketball player. Um, and they, they love playing NBA 2000 and they were meant to go overseas to play basketball, but, you know, COVID hit and... Um, yeah, I, I think I was seeing them because of um, some concerns around anxiety and um, some school refusal there. But, um, you know, they've, they've gone from mainstream school to TAFE and now they're doing really well. And I was like, well, I don't think you, you do have a disorder right now that needs treating, um, mm -hmm. but keep playing basketball, keep doing the face-to-face -face stuff. Um, and the mum uh, was appropriately um, limiting uh, their activities and setting boundaries. So, and I guess one of the one of the related kind of points to make in the in the time of COVID, mm. you know, social interaction can be curtailed because you know you might be in lockdown. You're in Melbourne. Yeah. it's worth noting that for for people who are for people who enjoy video games, you can have online communities that provide social interaction, social support. I mean, you know, the world, the world health organization came out and had that play a part together movement. You know, the idea that, mm. you know, rather than engaging in, in potentially um, more, more uh, unhealthy types of behaviors in, in isolation, yeah, this can be an appropriate release an appropriate method of interacting with others. Now it's not yeah. going to be for everybody. And yeah, say that there aren't problematic aspects to online gaming communities just like there are in any community yeah but things used appropriately you know for, for different folks can offer different benefits and, and that's that's worth bearing in mind yeah 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 um and uh in the report that you submitted um you you quoted one of your papers that looked at different games a list of games and whether they had loot boxes in them and, and you found a percentage of them did have loot box mechanisms. What were some of the games that I might recognize on there and, and what were the stats that you found? Right. So let me just, I'll grab a, I've got a copy of the table sitting there because it's been a while now, but so basically what we did was we looked at, we surveyed all the games released in 2016 and 2017 that contained loot boxes. Yep. And then from that list, um, we looked at how many of those loot boxes met, the psychological criteria. Uh -huh. for game. Yeah. We found that approximately half of them, and, and we also included um, a kind of another criteria that, that related to legal definitions, which is the ability to cash out. You know, we were talking yeah. about marketplaces. Can you take your winnings and cash them out? Yeah. Yep. And um, so we found that approximately half wow. of the games in, in, in the list, the games that had been released on console and PC. We didn't look at mobile apps, but we looked yep. at console that had been released during that time frame with loot boxes. Half of those loot box mechanisms met the psychological criteria for gambling. Wow, 50%. And yeah, uh, close, close enough. It was 40 something, 42, 48. I can't quite remember. Yeah. But um, the, other, the other thing we noted is that the, the games that didn't meet all five criteria tended to miss out on that competitive advantage. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Intense all of, rewards. Yeah. Almost all of these games, all all of these loot box mechanisms at the time involved paying money for an unknown outcome that might or might not be valuable. You know, right, so right. Going back to that idea of well, how might these mechanisms affect player engagement? You know. Yeah. And again, we don't know long term what effects this might have on you know, excessive playtime or excessive spending, if, if they'll have any effects. Yeah. 
that idea of once you once you're de- delivering rewards on a variable ratio reinforcement schedule and yeah. you have to pay for these random rewards yeah you're there at that kind of motivational mechanism that we we know in in, in lots of other contexts yeah promote. so i think okay. um a, a really good paper would be to do would be um not the competitive advantage of say a particular reward but the social advantage within the game comparing a, a really rare skin that doesn't make you more powerful everyone's like oh that guy has a really 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 really, really, really rare skin that guy's cool and it's spot on so this is this is a this idea of of, of subjective utility value mm-hmm. to players that's conferred by that kind of um the esteem in your peer group in your community yep. um like you say no not necessarily any monetary value not necessarily any competitive value but still enormous subjective value because of as you say yeah this played a long time to 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 get that or you know you know it it, those kind of things are i think a really valuable avenue for further research yeah oh this is yeah this has been a great conversation um one last silly question do you think ushis are considered a loot box (laughs) okay so i got asked (laughs) i actually got asked this question from somebody else this week oh Um, yeah Okay, so what we have here is a situation where you, you, you have a thing and you don't know what you've got till you open it. But I guess the difference, the, uh, okay, so I have to say no, I don't think they're loot boxes. Right. I think one of the key, they, they're definitely a random reward item. Yeah. But the thing is you're not, you're not paying money for the Ushi. You're paying money for your groceries and being ah. given the Ushi as a thing, you know? So I think, <laughs> yeah, in terms of, you know, how they, how these reward mechanisms might increase consumer spending on their groceries, that's a different, uh-huh. thing. I don't uh-huh. have it, right? Um, but no, I, I don't, I, I'd be reluctant yep. to Ushi the uh, loot boxes at this uh, point. That makes, yeah, that makes sense. But hey, thanks, Jim, for um, this great, this really fascinating, fun interview. I'd love to do it again, actually, because there's so many little things that I've got to look back. And um, I'd love to. How do, how can people follow you or uh, get in contact with you or get your papers? Yeah, cool. Um, so I'm on I, I I'm on Twitter sometimes mm-hmm. at James Saw, so J A M E S S A U E R. Um, you can also if you if you Google Jim Saw Utahs, um, my my university website will pop up and that has you know contact details and links to papers and those kind of things. So the the easiest thing if you're interested is is probably just ping me an email. You know, cool. happy to happy to respond and share papers. Yeah. Thanks again so much, Jim. I'll uh, stop this recording. Thank you. Uh, oh.